It's known as an Arizona disease. So how did Valley Fever pop up more than a thousand miles away? Well, new research in Arizona isn't just trying to prevent and understand the fungus, but also digging up centuries old secrets. Team 12's Colleen Sikora shows us how the research is busting a myth surrounding Valley Fever. What lives microscopic in the soil and gets into the air. One day I woke up and I was really sick. And I was so sick, I couldn't even get my head off the pillow. Becoming a valley fever infection in Sharon Philippe. It felt as if I, if I, as if someone was hitting my arm with a baseball bat every two inches and breaking it. The pain was so severe in my bones. That day was more than 20 years ago. I realized that most people don't even know this exists, just like myself. Latest data from the state health department finding more than 11,000 people were diagnosed with valley fever in 2021, most in Maricopa County. Really is a disease of the southwest. We think of it as Arizona's disease. Recently, valley fever found in south central Washington state in specific spots with a few cases connected to it. Our goal was to set out to try to figure out how on earth did it get up there. Dr. David Engelthaler with TGen among the group that studied that very question. But we also looked really importantly at the genomics of this fungus and, and inside the DNA of the fungus, it starts to tell us a bunch of secrets that we, we couldn't figure out otherwise. Essentially able to find out where it came from based on the changes in its DNA. Finding the valley fever that's in the soil in Washington came from the central basin of California seven to 10,000 years ago. It likely got moved up into that region several thousand years ago by a large infected animal, most likely a human or a dog and then got buried in the soil and maybe stayed hidden there, just kind of growing, living underground, and then it gets disturbed, and then cases started showing up maybe several thousand years later. Soil disturbance containing clues as to how the disease spreads. The fungus isn't everywhere. It's not everywhere all the time. TGen placing air filters around the valley to investigate how the fungus spreads. One of the common myths about valley fever is that the biggest risk is these giant haboobs and these dust storms but it doesn't seem to be associated with valley fever. It doesn't seem like those dust storms are really driving the fungus uh, to get into the air for people to breathe. We're not seeing it in the filters. We're not seeing an increase in cases after these dust storms. They might still play a role, but we haven't figured that out yet. Instead, finding hot spots come and go, even in the most endemic of regions. What that means is that the fungus is not just on the top surfaces of the soil. It is likely that the fungus is mostly below the soil, it has to get disturbed, construction, gardening, digging, gets it up into the air, and then we breathe it in. Important to understand. It's helping us answer a lot of questions about, are there important times of the year? Is there important weather events? Are there specific conditions which cause an increased risk for people to get exposed to valley fever? We haven't solved it all yet, and we're still trying to unlock that mystery. As the disease itself is often a mystery underdiagnosed. I would say a rough approximation is that probably four out of five cases are not being diagnosed, at least initially. Dr. John Galgiani is the director of the Valley Fever Center for Excellence at the University of Arizona. A small percentage of people get very, very sick from valley fever. So the sooner you figure that out, uh, the more you can use actually aggressive, appropriate therapy for those patients and get them the, the treatment they need. Time matters to unlock what's going on beneath the surface. I hope people, when they start feeling sick, know to get themselves checked out right away. Colleen Sikora, 12 News.